Okay, as already announced, I'm going to talk about the last chance humanity has. The world is on a path that is not sustainable in many aspects, economically, socially, and environmentally. The most recent calculations from Oxfam showed that the 80 richest people in the world own as much as the bottom 50% of the population. Yes, indeed, these people will fit into that London bus you can see here. Only last week, the number of refugees reached an historical high where 60 million people had to leave their home behind. We are heating up the planet, but most importantly, this is not about environmental protection. This is about rescuing the human species because the world will keep on turning without us. But there is reason to be optimistic, and I'm saying this as a rather pessimistic person myself. Why? Because during the last couple of years, I met so many people who inspired me, challenged me, and helped me to grow. But before I'll tell you what I'm trying to set up now, bringing it all together, I want to share the journey that brought me right here with you today. In order to do so, I'll let you know what neuroscience, habits, and solution journalism have to do with the last chance humanity has and why I'm currently involved in setting up a new media company that actually focuses on solutions. When I was a kid, I loved to read and write, and I actually wanted to become a journalist. So I went to the local newspaper, spent my internship there, and continued to write for them. And even during my studies, I continued to work for different media companies, but I did not become a journalist. I became a neuroscientist, and I investigated the human brain. So I looked into other people's head, for example, here, I looked into the head of my boyfriend. Isn't that something you'd like to do sometimes? So I moved to the Netherlands to do my research master there, and then afterwards moved to London and joined a group that focuses on awareness and consciousness. And coming from a village where you can actually see the cows grazing in front of your window, that was quite a scary move, to go to London, where eight million people try to find their way every day. So why neuroscience? I was fascinated by the observation that we all seem to perceive the world slightly different and therefore also act and behave in different ways. Let me give you an example. Is this dress actually white or blue? The difference in your answer shows us the difference in our perception and it ha has actually made it to the front pages a couple of months ago. So I was interested in how changeable our brain is. And it turns out that it's actually remarkably changeable. When I was still at high school, and I'm not that old yet, the world still believed that new neurons could not be built in the adult human brain. But then in 1998, the first researchers were actually able to show that even in the adult human brain, new neurons were born. So, for example, on this picture, all the dots are neurons, and the ones labeled as red are new ones. And in this case, this picture was taken in the adult mouse brain, so not a human. As a new scientist, I was particularly interested in investigating the relationship between how changeable our brain is and our perception. So, I tried to compare or look at the relationship between two important aspects. On the one hand, new experiences and learning. And on the other hand, our current brain state. And what I first did is to look at how new experiences can actually ch change our brain. So for example, if I would take a picture of your brains right now and then send you away for a couple of weeks and tell you to learn to juggle and then take a picture of your brain again and compare those two afterwards, those two pictures would actually look slightly different. Interestingly, the history of your brain actually determines how, you would ch how your brain would change due to this learning experience and also how you would learn to juggle. And more interestingly even, the activity in your brain right now actually influences how you perceive incoming information, like me talking to you right now. So what I was able to show during my PhD is that there's an ongoing loop between new experiences and learning and our current brain state. Because the activity in your brain right now influences how you perceive new incoming information and have these new experiences, like me talking to you. And on the other hand, new experiences 
and the history of your brain influence your current brain state. So what's going on in your brain right now? Neuroscientists are often interested in the occasion when something actually goes wrong. Or say, not quite right. So for example, if you imagine that your expectations are not met, what would happen in your brain? Again, to give you an example, just imagine you would walk into a hospital and instead of doctors and nurses coming towards you, trying to treat patients around you, this guy would actually run towards you and ask you to hurry up and get your swimsuits in order to help him to rescue some careless tourists in the bay. Then your brain would go slightly haywire, including with some other, other bodily reactions like staring, startling, and open jaw. And your brain would change. And together with the changes in your brain, your expectations the next time you walk into a hospital would also change. And if you would walk in such a hospital over and over again, your concept of a hospital would slow, slowly change as well. And you might actually end up taking some swimsuits next time you go to a hospital. This is also how we form habits. It is a habit if you brush your teeth. It is a habit if you drink your Friday evening beer and if you go to your Monday evening yoga class in order to welcome the next week. But it's also a habit if you go to a shop and pay for your goods using money or credit card. Referring back to the loop between new experiences and learning on the one side and the current brain activity on the other side, nothing new or unexperienced happens in the case you pay with money. Only a new experience, like the guy in front of you t trading his yogurt and cheese for chicken, for example, would have the ability to change the activity in your brain and therefore the expectation the next time you enter the shop. Habits are determining our life. They determine what we think, what we do, in which order, and how we think the world functions. Most of the time, or very often, they're actually culturally determined, like the favorite color for baby girls being pink, which was actually the typical boy's color in the past. Habits are important because they help us to not think about everything over and over again. Just imagine you get up in the morning and you would have to remind yourself to get dressed before you leave the house. Or that a cup of coffee will help you to wake up. But they also restrict us. They restrict our thinking and we might get stuck because we no longer challenge the status quo. For those who haven't seen this, try to connect the following nine dots with four straight lines without putting your imaginary pencil down in between. You're not going to be able to do it until you start thinking quite literally outside of the box. So how does this relate to the challenges we face economically, socially, and environmentally, and possible solutions to solve them? It is due to our habits that we are in this doomsday scenario now. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I like to talk about journeys and paths. And I think the current path we are on is pointing downwards. And what people try to do now is to come up with solutions that are slightly different, that run almost parallel to the old path. And importantly, they use the habits and procedures that we used for the old path in order to fix the problems we are facing. So the company manager comes up with an organic tofu burger next to its meat products. The car company builds one electric car next to its big fleet of combustion engine cars. You might have, or you probably have, all replaced your light bulb with energy-saving bulbs, and you neatly separate your waste in the weekend. And indeed, these are important steps and habits. But what all these changes have in common is that they refer to the old past in terms of the costs and benefits. And also, they're usually full of restrictions and wagging fingers and certainly not much fun. I guess I don't have to remind anybody in, Der in Germany about the Veggie Day debate. What I propose instead is a past that deserves to be called new. A past that truly differentiates from the old past, a past that might seem scary in the first place, a past really off the beaten track. But what I can tell you from my personal experience is that the passes described as being off the beaten track in the tourist guide are usually the ones most rewarding and impressive, like this one I took in Spain last year. 
And importantly, what this tells us is that it boils down to the personal level of all of us. Instead of neatly separating your waste, why not thinking about creating no waste at all? Instead of building one sustainable product, why not transforming your whole value chain and your whole product line into one that is sustainable? Most importantly, and even though the new path might be scary and unknown, it needs to be fun. It needs to be the party in town that is sold out because everybody wants to go. But how do we achieve that? By using something that is called reframing. By talking about future instead of sustainability. Because the future is suddenly interesting and the future is sexy and we're all involved in it. Just imagine the future will be wonderful and it's your fault. So it pretty much comes down to changing our old habits, keeping our brain challenged, brush your teeth with the other hand, walk back home a slightly different path. You might have heard these little tricks in order to keep your brain challenged, in order to question your routines. But this doesn't only involve these daily chores, because this involves the basics of our society, our economy, and our education. Slavoj Cicek, in my opinion, the only non-analytical philosopher who is actually fun reading and listening to, usually says something along the following lines. We seem to live in a world where everything is possible. You can travel to the moon. You can become immortal by biogenetics. We can change from a man to a woman and the other way around. But if you want to raise taxes a little bit for the rich, if you want more money for the healthcare, they will tell you impossible too expensive, we can't afford that. Reframing is not simply renaming. It involves more than that. And coming back to the aspect of fun, I wonder who would vote against cleaner cities, against a fairer society, and against more free time. And reframing can be done in all areas, including our media, the source where we get a lot of our information from. So what does the media do to us? You probably know, all know the feeling. You switch on the radio in the morning, you skim the newspaper, you watch the evening news, and you feel bombarded by the negative headlines and the bad news and shocking stories. We all get overwhelmed by the global problems that we face. And we feel everything we would do would rather be a drop in the ocean. Studies have shown that these media leave us with certain emotions that are all negative. We are getting stressed, we are getting cynic, we are getting hopeless, and we get a way too negative picture of the world. And most importantly, we end up being passive. So what is necessary to get us active again? The opposite kinds of emotions need to be triggered. We need to be hopeful again, we need to feel empowered, we need to be content, and we need to get, need to get a more realistic picture of the world. But how do we achieve that? By using something that is called solution-oriented or constructive journalism. This kind of journalism doesn't stop with the explanation of problems, but it actually also shows the solutions that are either already implemented or discussed. Internationally, there are many examples of media initiatives and journalists who are using solution-oriented journalism. The correspondent in the Netherlands, Positive News in Great Britain, the broadcasting companies in Sweden and Denmark, the Reporters des Esprits in France and in Germany? This question mark brings me back to my journey and the question what neuroscience has to do with solution-oriented journalism. Together with an ever-growing team of fellow scientists, universities, NGOs and other organizations, companies and individuals, I'm currently setting up Positive Daily, the first German solution-oriented journalism project that focuses on solutions and that reports about our future that could be better. Our articles are not fluffy, they are not esoteric or feel-good, but they are high quality, scientifically researched and innovative. And most importantly, we are convinced that showing a different perspective on problems can, can stimulate solution-oriented thinking, showing all of you how you can contribute to these solutions too. 
Positive Daily wants to challenge your experiences, wants to give you new experiences for your brain so that you might end up taking your swimsuit to the hospital. So why am I optimistic? Because one thing I realized is that the science and technology to turn this all around is there. The only thing that needs to change is our heads. During the last couple of years, I got to know so many individuals who are questioning the status quo, who are not scared of walking the truly new path, or let's say not scared enough because they actually realize that following the old path would be much scarier in the long run. And these people help to create tipping points. For example, the Dutch, or Dutch organization Nederland Kantelt, which basically means the Netherlands are tipping, that brings together changers and front runners who are trying to challenge the old habits and stimulate people to come up with solutions that are more future-oriented. Or the international network of economic students called Rethinking Economics that are demanding a change of their curriculum because they think it's too much focused on neoliberal thinking. Once you start looking, you actually get overwhelmed by the number and effort of people that are challenging the status quo. And most of the time, they seem to enjoy what they are doing. But these people need a voice, a voice that can be heard, and a voice that stimulates other people to think and dis discuss these solutions too. One thing I learned as a scientist is that science is just a state too. Just like your brain state at any given time. That when new, experience comes in, new experiences are made or new evidence comes in, it might change. And it is actually pretty rewarding to admit I changed my mind because I learned something new. We don't need to be scared to admit that we were wrong, that we updated our ideas. Humanity is at a crossroad. We need to decide whether we are going to follow the truly new path, the last chance humanity has. Positive Daily wants to join this, but for that we need you, many of you. So what is my conclusion? Our brain is changeable. We can change our habits and think new ways to live a future that is better for us and our surroundings. But change is scary. And usually people don't do scary things on their own. And that's why we need to be in this together. Thank you.